Okay, sorry about that. Are we, I think we're cool. Awesome. Da, 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 da. Okay, so I will dive in. Okay, hi, I am Allison Siglin. <laughs> um, so today I wanna kind of give you an update on what's going on with the real estate market and how you can become a successful homeowner and a buyer and really you know, figure out how to compete in the market today. So we'll dive right in. Let's go over home prices. So this is gonna be a look at price appreciation year over year, starting back in January of 2021 um, to today, January 2020. Well, I guess we're in March, but looking from January 21 to January 2022. So we've definitely been um, increasing dramatically. We've increased. Uh, so if you look starting January 2021, basically that 10% means from January of 2020 to January of 2021, home prices have increased by 10%. Now looking forward in January 2022, we're at 19.1%. So levels started to uh, level out at about 18% last summer. And experts thought that we were going to start to see a decelerated um, rate of appreciation, which meant, you know, a continued increase, but at a slower pace. And, you know, reality is just showing that that's not actually the case. And this is a direct result from high buyer demand and low supply. Um, so what you'll see is changes overall without, within the nation is it's showing an average rate of appreciation at 17.5%. Uh, this is from uh, Q4 of 2021. So yes, some states were a little bit higher, some were a little bit lower. You can see that across the board. But the reality is we didn't have any depreciation in any single state, which is absolutely wild, quite honestly. And then what that means really looking back into the future is, okay, so if we look 30 years ago, the national average of home prices has actually increased 258% in the last 30 years. So, so many people right now are asking, is this really the right time to, to buy? You know, the market might be crazy. Um, our rate, our, our, house price is really continuing, going to continue to appreciate. And I mean, if you were to look back here, right here, 30 years ago, and I were to ask you 30, you know, would you have bought 30 years ago? You would have said, yeah, 100%. Like historically, real estate is just a very strong investment. Um, if you were to look historically, you're going to see that never has it been really a depreciating asset. Um, another amazing you know, uh, basically indicator of what's going on in the market and why is now it's still an okay time to buy. So what we're looking at for the future now is, okay, is this going to continue? And yes, it is. So we basically look at seven key entities who forecast out home prices uh, or who have forecasted out home prices for the rest of the year. And if you average all those out, you'll see the teal bar shows an average appreciation rate of 6.1% for the rest of the year. Now, considering that we started with 19% in January, this is very conservative. So in actuality, I would bet that the reality is gonna be home appreciation is gonna continue to rise, home prices are gonna to continue to rise and likely at a higher rate than that average 6.1%. Again, a direct result between supply and demand. So let's dive into that a little bit more. Uh, as I've mentioned that a few times now, obviously we all know we're in a seller's market, right? So that really directly explains why the inventory has impacted the home prices. It's simple. Anytime there's more buyers for an item, that there are people selling that item, prices are gonna to continue to rise because people are willing to pay more for them. It's the exact opposite of a buyer's market where you would have more home, homes available for sale than buyers interested in purchasing them and naturally prices are gonna decline. So what does that look like from an inventory perspective? Basically what happened is leading up to the crash in 09, we had, a ton of housing starts, which means new construction, right? And when it crashed, construction absolutely came to a halt. 
and we were not building for years. And actually the next slide I like even better. So what happened is right before the crash, we had four consecutive years of record setting home builds. And then immediately after the crash, we declined dramatically. And we have never been able to catch up even to the average annual amount of units built since then. And so we're just always in both of these, this hole has not been filled. So we're still in just a, a you know, a, a, a deficit, if you will, of supply. Again, um, here's another way of looking at it. So currently, supply-wise, we're at about, actually today, an updated numbers were less than about 850,000 homes for sale in the nation, which is insane, so less than a million. And on average, we typically have 2.5 million homes for sale, which makes it that like in between neutral market, if you will. So again, proving that we are way below on supply and therefore it is causing those, uh, those prices to continue to go up. Likewise, here we go. So everyone keeps thinking, oh my God, this is a bubble. You know, the market's gonna crash. This is just like how it was right before the 08, 09 crash. And it's just not the same at all. Our inventory is so low and leading up to the crash, we had a dramatically increased amount of inventory. So supply of existing homes, um, extremely more than what we're looking at right now. So this is just a, a super clear picture of exactly why it's different. Um, and then moving into it, you're also going to see the year over year change in housing inventory in general. So it's continuing to decrease this inventory, right? So homes are, we, ha we don't have a lot of supply. They are selling super quickly and we're not building quick enough. We have too much demand. More and more people are getting into that, the real estate market, looking to buy, um, you know, starting families. The average age of a first time home buyer is about 33 years old. And you'll see here that now, they, these are the people that are out there trying to buy. And since we have so many more of them than we did in 2006, you'll see there was a, a decrease in housing or in births, uh, which created a decrease in the consumer. And now that we have an exponentially amount higher, more people that were born, um, you're gonna have a higher demand. So that's basically what's happening right now is that 33 year old market, um, is out there buying and it's really, you know, increasing that demand. And that's where you're seeing a lot of that, uh, the home prices, you know, going crazy because of that, because of the low supply and the high demand. Um, additionally, the credit availability uh, was kind of outrageous uh, before the crash, so we were seeing tons of people who weren't actually qualified to own homes getting mortgages. So nowadays we have much stricter lending uh, guidelines where you'll see right here in February, 2021, um, we are, and even now in 2022, I mean, this is a year out now. So same thing though, and that's, you know, everything is just continuing to get, get stricter in terms of lending standards and um, people aren't able to qualify for as much. And the, the rate of default has dramatically declined. I think uh, I was just reading recently that the number of foreclosures in um, the nation are less than 1% right now, which is also wildly different from pre-crash in 2008-2009. So again, another example, this is the volume of loans in billions with people with the credit borrowers with a credit score of less than 620. So you're going to see right here in 2007, you had $325 billion worth of loans that were directly related to borrowers with a credit score less than 620 which means they're 
qualification standards and ability to repay were much less. Right now, we have maybe 50 billion. Um, well, that's Q3 2021, but imagine it's it's following the same trend line that you have maybe 50 billion dollars worth of loans right now linked to borrowers with a credit score of less than 620, which means your borrowers just aren't as risky anymore these days because there are, are guidelines put in place that just don't allow that anymore. Um, and additionally, the equity growth in the nation is absolutely insane. It is just continuing to surge and surge and surge. So on average, you'll see here, so Q3 2021, Q3 2020, if you lived in California, you on average were making $119,000 worth of equity on your home. National average for that year to year, it was 56,700. And I know from uh, today to last year, your average in California, average equity was 156,000. So 156,000 compared to 119 just from a year, it just, it's to, you know, continuing to grow. Um, so, all the reasons as to why we're not seeing a crash anytime soon. Um, but now you think, okay, now what? So how do I break into this market? Um, that's great, happy to hear that, but how do I compete because it's crazy right now, right? So what happens or what we suggest and how we guide our clients is we help them become bulletproof. So first we like to take an intake client call and we really address the psychology of the buyer today. So it's crazy out there, right? We've got insane headlines. There's going to be a crash. The housing booms over. It's going to bust, blah, blah, blah. Should we really buy? Interest rates are through the roof. But they don't really explain anything other than that. It's all clickbait, right? So what we like to do is we really like to arm our clients with an upfront market analysis on what is actually happening in the current housing market, which is basically exactly what I just went through with you guys. And then showing them why it is this way and why you should buy and how you can do it. And really taking the emotion out of it and the fear and really educating them with strong information so that they can make educated and, uh, and, and you know, smart decisions. And so that based on top of then we move forward, we explain, you know, the steps of the loan. Okay, here's what's happening. Sometimes we're getting appraisal gaps where your borrower might be forced to, you know, their appraisal comes in $75,000 below list price, right? Well, as a lender, we can only lend on the lower amount of the two. So we give them a heads up. Hey, this is what we're seeing in the marketplace. Sometimes this is happening. Let's attack this from the start, figure out what our options would be if this were to be the case in your situation and how we can address that moving forward so that if this happens, we're not caught off guard, we're not freaking out, we're not emotional, and we know what our game plan is and we know how to move forward. Then we continue on and we fully underwrite our clients. So we do a full underwritten approval. And basically what that means is we don't need you to have a property in mind. We simply need to collect all your documentation, cross every T, dot every I, you know, cross any uh, issue that we may have with your, your loan file and really button up your file so that we can remove loan contingencies. So when you're submitting an offer, you're submitting the strongest offer possible. Removing that loan contingency basically means that you can now compete with an all cash offer. You're telling the seller, there is no way I'm gonna fall out of this loan. We are as strong as cash. And that's huge right now because we all know that cash offers are beating out most finance offers. Um, and similarly, we can even take you another step further and we can make you an all cash buyer. So I'll dive into that next, but basically we have a loan program where um, we are able to get you fully underwritten. We buy the house for you in cash and we get your offer accepted at a lower price 
than we would if you were to finance because um, the average price of an all cash offer is about 2.6% lower than a finance offer. And you're saving money that way. You get your dream house um, and you can still finance the house on your own, but you were able to come in looking like a, a cash offer. So let's dive into all these, you know, situations, right? So stop reading the headlines, um, all these crazy articles, clickbait, what have you, it's not real, right? So we're gonna go and we're gonna show you, okay, if you are thinking you are not gonna buy and you're just gonna keep renting, right? Okay, cool. Well, can you stay in that house for the next five years and continue renting? Well, probably not. That's probably why you're looking to buy in the first place, right? Maybe you're having kids or you've outgrown your current place. So what we like to do is we like to actually compare apples to apples, not apples to oranges. So I think where a lot of lenders um, kind of go wrong is they get a lead, they get a client, and then they say, cool, um, I'm gonna pre-approve you for your max purchase price and you were paying $2,500 in rent before. Well, here's your pre-approval for a mortgage payment. And now you're paying $4,500 and that's great. Two hours later, I get this pre-approval over to your realtor. Your realtor thinks you're cool. You think you're cool because you did it all quick. And the buyer is now freaking out because they don't know and they don't think that they can afford an extra $2,000 a month on their mortgage payment. And that's because they didn't go through the actual steps, right? They didn't go through the process. They didn't explain what's happening in the market. They didn't explain that rent typically goes up every single year and that you're probably not going to be staying in that same house that you're in right now renting for another five years. And so it's really like, it's a big picture that you really have to do a deep dive and compare um, so that you can compare apples to apples and not apples to oranges. So basically what we do is we like to, something similar to this, we like to really give them a full uh, breakdown as to what that looks like, how we get from rent and how we get to mortgage and show them you know, how maybe their, their payment, if they were to continue renting at a bigger house, and rent prices continue to increase, maybe then your rent for the month goes up to $4,200. Well, now you have a mortgage for $4,500 and that $300 difference is a bit more manageable than 2000, right? And not even that, but at the end of your mortgage or even after five years, you're, you would have paid $200,000 in rent versus gaining $200,000 worth of equity. So again, big picture, you know, it, it's super important to look at all this um, because I really think that it makes a difference. And again, you know, we're not in the business to sell homes. We're in the business to educate our clients and to get them to really understand what's happening in the market and why real estate is a good investment. And if it's not right, you know, we walk through that with them as well. And we help them come up with a plan as to how to get there and what makes sense for them. So moving forward, I mentioned the appraisal gap strategy. Basically, this allows us to, you know, cut that fear off at the very beginning. So appraisal gaps have been such an issue during this time period because appraisers just simply aren't able to keep up with the sale of houses, right? So you could be in escrow on a property and down the street, you could have a sale the day before that was you know, $1.4 million and you're trying to buy for 1.2 and your appraisal comes in at 1.1 and you're saying, but this just sold at 1.4. Well, the appraiser isn't able to necessarily keep up with all of that you know, all of the, the sales as quickly as we would like to think, right? So appraisal gaps have seriously impacted sales. And, and by that, I mean, it's either delayed the escrow period by 
in May of 2021, 26%, or it actually created 13% of all sales to completely fall out and just go away because they didn't have an appraisal gap strategy. So what does that look like? Basically, let's say your purchase price is $800,000. Your appraised value comes back at $725,000. So now you're $75,000 less uh, in lending form, right? So we can only lend on that $725 value. So we were going to put down 20%. Now we're going to edit that a little bit. And we're only going to put $81,000 down. So your loan amount now has decreased, or sorry, increased just a little bit from 640 to 644. So I'm gonna get out my calculator so I can go through this with you guys. So basically you're not putting down, you're, you're, because we're not putting the 20% down because of the gap, we're only putting you know just over 10%. We are saving $79,000. But look, your loan amount hardly changes. It increases only by $4,000. So your closing costs stay the same. Prepaid taxes stay the same. Now, because you're not putting down 20%, you're going to pay mortgage insurance. But we're going to pay that up front in a one-time fee. So now you've got, um, you've got the $75,000 in purchase, which you have to now make up. So instead of the 160 that you're putting down, you're putting down 81, you have that 79,000 left over. So of that 79,000, you fill that 75,000 gap. We'll credit you a little bit to help you make up that mortgage insurance premium, let's say 1600 bucks. Now your cash to close is less than original, 168,671. Interest rate stays the same. Principal and interest rises just barely because that loan amount and purchase price changed. Tax is the same, insurance basically the same. And now at the end of it, you're left with a total payment of only $18 more than you would have. And the problem is a lot of lenders do not coach their clients through this. They think, okay, well, you still have to put 20% down from that 725 and you have to come up with the additional 75,000 in cash. Well, that's just not the case. And so this is where we're able to get creative and really coach this to our clients. Now I will say, we really only have options like this when clients are putting down 10% or more, but it's better than nothing. And, and so this is what we're able to offer them. So now moving forward, we wanna get you fully underwritten. So you go out shopping, you're pre-approved to start, we get your appraisal gap strategy in place, now you're submitting offers, right? Well, we want you to be as strong as possible. So we're going to fully underwrite you, which means someone from our team is going to physically look through all of your documents, verify employment, verify funds, um, this, that, and the other. And they are going to fully underwrite you with a TBD address, we'll say. And basically all we ask is, yes, it costs money on our end, but we think that this is what we owe our clients in order for them to be successful in the market these days. And all we ask from you is, are you ready to actively make offers in the next 60 days? And are we the right lending team for you? Are we a good partner for you? Do you like working with us? Great. Then we will do this on your behalf. We would be happy to help you in this way. And you might have to provide a couple more documents, um, but you're fully under it. And that allows you to submit what is most similar to an all cash offer, removing those loan contingencies. And then moving forward, if we really want to submit an all cash offer, we have programs for that as well. So let's say you are currently a home owner and you want to buy, but you're scared like everyone else and you don't think that there's any inventory to buy. Well, why don't we get you fully underwritten? Keep your house. We're going to approve you and get you fully underwritten for your max purchase price, then go out shopping, find your dream home. We buy it on your behalf with all cash. And then you can turn around and sell your house. And when you sell your house, all you have to do is pay a, uh, basically it's a, a program fee, if you will, or cost of getting your house these days. Um, 
And as a preferred lender for this program, the rate is about 2.75% of the purchase price. But you get to move into your new house right away. You get to sell your old house. And additionally, we even have programs that allows you to renovate your existing house for sale. So when you sell it, you get a higher list price. You get a higher sales price. You make more money. You make up that 2.75% uh, program fee for buying the house in all cash. So there's a ton of information I can do that like dives into this way more because it's a very robust program, but um, it works. Uh, we just closed a loan with this program for somebody last week. They were submitting offers on a house uh, one point, they had gone, the list price was 1.35. They submitted a financing offer of 1.41. They were denied. They said, we're really holding out for an all cash offer. So we flipped them over to this program. We said, cool, we'll give you an all cash offer at 1.2. And they accepted it. So they saved almost $200,000 in their purchase price because they went cash. So that's what I was saying. The cash buyers are paying about 2.6% less on their purchase price because they're submitting all cash. So this is huge. So you might be paying 2.7 in your program fee, but you're not spending as much because your purchase price is lower. So again, so much more information. I would love to dive into this on another time or reach out to me separately, but um, that's kind of that. <laughs> Um, and then really that kind of rounds everything out. I know that was a lot and I spoke really quickly, <laughs> um, but that really kind of goes over what's happening in the market, how you can be the most aggressive buyer out there, how we would love to be your heart partner and help you do that. Um, so I would love to, you know, chat offline with anyone who might be interested in learning more. Uh, we definitely have different types of loan programs for all scenarios, um, BA, FHA, investment, um, bank stated, non-QM, conventional, you name it, we can do it. So I would be happy to help anyone moving forward and open to any questions. Awesome, that was great. Thank you so much for the presentation. And uh, let's see if there's any questions.